Hi, today we're going to give you five reasons why decision making is broken in many of our organizations and why you should care and why organizations should make it a strategic priority to develop the decision making capability of their people. Great, thanks Garen. So agility is a core competitive advantage and being able to make fast effective decisions lies at the heart of this. A Deloitte study in 2022 showed that effective organisational decision making is strongly linked to better business outcomes and it's a barometer of the health of a culture. Yet we meet many leaders who are dissatisfied with the pace of decision making in their organisations. They tell us that current structures and decision making models are blocking much needed agility. And McKinsey's found that nearly three quarters of senior leaders thought that bad strategic decisions were the prevailing norm in their organisations. So being a decision maker in today's organisations is tough. With so much change and volatility, managers are facing an ever-increasing number of more complex decisions and organisations need whole teams that are capable of making strong business decisions, not just a small tranche of senior leaders. So effective decision making can positively influence every aspect of an organisation's running, its efficiency, the quality of its products or services, the quality of its strategies that get developed and the extent to which they're executed. And decision-making impacts on the motivation, engagement and well-being of our people too. So people who are satisfied with decision-making in their organisations are likely to experience over, a greater overall job satisfaction. But actually only half of people are actually satisfied with their current involvement in decision-making in their organisations. So there's a lot of room for improvement. Brilliant. So we're going to give you five reasons. We're going to start with number one, which is reason one, and that's the wrong mindset. So what often happens is there's a lack of awareness about our own decision making approach, our abilities or our bias. And this is really important because it significantly impacts the quality of our decisions and their outcomes at a personal level, a team level and an organizational level as well. So just unpacking that a little bit. So we're unconsciously influenced by our biases. So often we aren't aware of the significant role that bias plays. There are over 186 cognitive biases that we're potentially prone to. So let's just pick one out, overconfidence bias. And this actually affects 80% of us. And what it does it actually leads us to underestimating the obstacles ahead of us when implementing a decision. And it often makes us overly optimistic of our abilities and can also lead us to underestimate how long something will take. This overconfidence bias can mean that people can present their ideas with such conviction. We all agree, even, even when we know there's a probability of this failing. Also, we overly rely on our intuition. So in the need for speed, decision makers are prone to applying their gut feel to guide their decision making, often using it with little supporting data. Now, this is fine if you're dealing with a known decision you've dealt with before. But if it's new and much of what we deal with is new, our intuition dramatically decreases in reliability. Yeah, the other thing with mindset is we just don't acknowledge the role of emotions. So we aren't aware how our emotions and our moods are shaping our decisions. So even things like the time of day can affect our, our decision making. Our serotonin levels start to dip in the afternoon, and that means we can become more risk averse. So the later in the day we have a meeting, the more likely we are to make a kind of risk averse decision. We also tend to see the world only from our perspective. So we don't think how our experience or our profession shapes the decision making approaches we're taking. And we look at the world primarily through our own lenses, and that impacts how we make sense of what's going on. So, you know, if we're in, in a company facing a cash crisis, a finance professional will see it as a finance problem, a sales professional will see it as a sales problem, but actually the reality is more complex than that. And, you know, we risk taking a very narrow approach to a more challenging, complicated situation. And we also confuse luck and coincidence with skill. So that's called the misattribution of success. And we mistake luck with high quality decision making. And that gives us a false sense of confidence in our ability. Yeah, and this is something you do see quite a lot. If, if a person makes a decision and it just happens to coincide with a positive outcome for the whole organisation, they'll often relate the two things, won't they? So reason two is the wrong direction. So we make decisions that are disconnected to the strategy. So strategy is a really important place to start when we're making a decision. However, the world is full of vague strategies and people really just don't know how it relates to their daily work. There's a lot of emphasis on what we're going to do, but very little on how we're going to do it. So different teams will interpret the strategy in contradictory ways. This leads to disjointed approaches. And also because they don't understand the strategy, they often are just invited just to carry on as before. So we often ask managers when we start to work with them if they've actually read and understood the strategy. The answer is often overwhelmingly no. So this means that the vast percentage of managers are often going about their daily business, making key decisions that are not necessarily guided by the strategy. And when we ask managers who's actually read the business plans of other teams that they've got close relationships with, often even less people say that they've read it. Also, we're overwhelmed by the urgent important. 
Prioritization is something that teams and organizations don't do very well. And it can be difficult to choose a priority and tell everyone to stop doing everything else, particularly when people enjoy or are used to doing the other things. And as a result, organizations often have a huge list of competing priorities. Also, we don't subtract anything else to make space for new decisions to work. Um, so we'll make a decision to launch something without stopping the old thing. So this could be implementing new technology without switching off the old technology. And it leads to people feeling confused and overwhelmed and having to decide for themselves what to focus on. So often we aren't all clear on the decision to be made. We often don't define our decisions clearly, or we make a decision that solves a symptom rather than the underlying problem. And we see decisions as a one-off event, and really in practice, decisions are actually a workflow with multiple decisions along the way. So all of the energy goes into the initial decision, and then our attention is, is taken elsewhere when it gets to the important bits. Yeah, and actually, when we work with leaders, often they aren't even conscious they're making decisions. You know, in writing their to-do list, they're unconsciously making decisions about what gets done and what doesn't and what's a priority and what's not. But that's not really a conscious thought in many leaders' minds. Yeah, really good point. And and, and also, we, we don't adapt our decisions according to impact and complexity. Mm. So, so not all decisions are the same. And, and leaders often don't categorise decisions. So a decision could be complex or complicated. It could be enterprise or tactical. And as a result, they apply the wrong approach. So, for example, an overcomplicated process might be applied to a simple decision and vice versa as well. Yeah. And then if we've not defined or identified decisions correctly up front, then we don't give ourselves enough time to collect data or different perspectives for the more complex situations. Yeah, really good point. So and, and also we don't delegate decision making effectively. Um, so we don't make clear the amount of authority we're giving to others. And vice versa. So someone who's actually receiving decision making authority might need some clarification, but what they don't want to come across as incompetence, so they don't go back to their manager. And also often decision making rights aren't clear up front. So who's actually making the decision and who has the power of veto? And again, this all adds to confusion. OK, so the third reason that decision making is broken is wrong culture. So most organisations just don't have a culture that supports or encourages good decision making. Decisions aren't made in a vacuum, and as we've already seen, how we make decisions is influenced by our own preferences, our experiences and personality, but also by the environment we find ourselves in. Even the most skilled decision maker will only be truly effective if they're operating in an organisation environment that supports them to make good decisions. So where does it go wrong? Well, the first culture related decision making issue relates to empowerment. Whilst many organisations have empowerment as one of their values, relatively few people working in those organisations truly believe they've got the capacity and authority to act independently and make decisions. Giving people decision making autonomy is essentially about distribution of power and trust. And we often, very often see leaders who pay lip service to relinquishing control. Yeah, and I think I think it's really important for leaders to be mindful of the shadow that they cast mm. with their actions. Um, their behaviours can actually stop people feeling able or safe enough or willing to step to step up and take ownership. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Yeah, that leads quite nicely onto the second problem with culture, and that's psychological safety. So decision making involves unknowns and it involves risks. And in many organisations, people just don't feel safe to make decisions. They fear reprisals if they're going to get it wrong. Yeah, or people don't feel safe to say uh, or debate ideas either, do they? No, they don't. Absolutely. And on a similar thing, I think too many decisions are made in silos. Too often there aren't clear expectations about ensuring the right people with the right skills, expertise and knowledge are involved in decision making. So people just run off and make a decision in isolation. So great decision making isn't just about a collection of individuals making individual decisions. The organisations that really excel at this, that are really good at decision making and as a consequence deliver really excellent results. They really understand the importance of collective decision making and have tapped into how to make it work. So the fourth element of culture we wanted to touch on is about transparency. So very few organisations support a real culture of transparency around information and knowledge. In too many organisations, people just don't know when, where and how key decisions are being made. So they then can't know how, when, where and how they can contribute. And not enough people have access to quality, up-to-date information they need to make good decisions. Even if it's actually available in the organisation, it's just not made available to the right people at the right time. And then lastly, too many organisations have an advice culture rather than a coaching one. You know, when managers default to giving advice rather than coaching people to develop their judgment, they're not giving them the opportunity to support and develop their own capabilities and confidence to make and execute great decisions. 
So tame that inner advice monster. Um, so reason four is the wrong processes. So our decision-making process is often really limited. So the research shows overwhelmingly that participatory decision-making outperforms this other decision-making approaches. So this requires our decision-makers to develop inclusive solutions that encourage shared responsibility and informed consent. Um, however, we often make too many yes-no decisions. So a 20-year study into decision-making found that 72% of strategic decisions are binary choices. So we don't actually take the time to step, take a step back and develop options. So it often becomes a binary choice. Do we do it or not? And this has a dramatic impact on outcomes. So the study found that 50% of strategic options, strategic decisions actually fail with one option. But if you add one additional option, that failure rate drops to 30%. And also, we're actually prone to letting dominant voices drive the process. So to get great decisions, we need to invite different perspectives. However, this divergence of thinking can often be overwhelming for managers. So they give up too quickly and advocate for their original ideas, or even worse, they satisfy. And that's choose the least worst option for everyone. So by not engaging with the fringes or difficult people, our solutions become quite limited. We're really not fully aware of how things could go wrong or what's been tried before. And this feeds overconfidence bias. And convergence, you know, getting people to the same place is really difficult when we concentrate decision making with just a few people and we don't engage people proactively in the decision. And actually what you end up with is like a hard to make decision mm. becomes a hard to swallow decision. So you know, for our stakeholders, and actually that you then increase the probability of resistance probably quite dramatically. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 we don't stick with it when it gets difficult yeah. um, because the good decision making can be quite challenging. Um, and this is where decisions often break down. It's where we need to stick with it, keep working at the problem, working through the options. We're trying to solve together to come up with the optimal um, response. So during this stage, people cannot get overly attached to their own ideas and solutions. So their effort actually goes into promoting and defending their ideas rather than finding the optimal solution and considering other people's good ideas. Also, we're not generally comfortable or skilled or trained at productive conflict. Absolutely. So we, yeah, so we, so we find it challenging to facilitate the contrasting views that you'll get from having different professionals around the table, particularly those stakeholders that are likely to disagree with us. Yeah, but there's so much power in in getting those differing views and really mm. getting them heard and worked through. Um, yeah, it has an exponential impact on the quality of the solution. Definitely. Um, and also, we don't use the right tools to improve our decisions. Um, we don't tend to leverage tools to help us in our thinking as we work through options. So we're maybe not as objective as much as we should be. And even using simple tools like decision trees or trade-off analysis can really flesh out the options so we know the risks we're taking or the potential implications. And these tools um, also encourage us to have a better decision making discussion as it gives us a, an opportunity to look at things objectively and look at the decision from different perspectives. And tools can really help us overcome the classic decision making issue of separating opinion from fact. Mm. Um, and finally, um, we don't think through the implications. So we, we are prone, again, through bias to fall in love with our solutions. So we don't spend time performing exercises like pre-mortems, which gets us to think through what the implications of our decisions might be and how they might go wrong. Great. Thanks, Garen. So reason five that decision making is broken is wrong execution. So great decisions are only as good as their execution. And we often forget to pay attention to how a decision is going to be implemented. Many of our organisations lack the capability to develop effective, well thought through plans to move a decision from an idea to a reality. And a big part of decision execution is how well a decision is accepted by those that it impacts and by those who, who've got a role in implementing the decision. And procedural justice plays a really important role here. So for people to truly buy into a decision, they need to understand that the process that has been followed, they need to understand the process that's been followed and to reach a decision that they believe was fair and transparent. And actually how we communicate decisions impacts really heavily on how they're accepted and implemented. Too often we see leaders forgetting to share the rationale for decisions or overly focusing on the benefits of decision or a change and not being open about the downsides. And people also frequently aren't given time or space to understand the decision and interpret what it means for them on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's a prerequisite for active engagement in making a decision a reality. Again, and lastly, implemented, implementation of decisions just isn't followed up and tracked effectively in our organisations. There's a real lack of accountability for follow-up and decisions end up being seen as fads that won't stick. And then, you know, people could just choose to ignore them and they'll go away and the next decision will come round. So that 
is a, a breakdown of the five reasons decision making is broken in our organizations. So just a quick summary. Reason one, the wrong mindset. We lack awareness about our own decision making capabilities. Reason two is the wrong direction. We make decisions without a clear sense of alignment to overall direction. Reason three is the wrong culture. Our organization cultures just don't support or encourage good decision making. Reason four is the wrong processes. Our decision making processes are limited and often unsophisticated. And reason five is the wrong execution. We just pay too little attention to the execution and fail to effectively execute and communicate decisions.